A warm welcome to everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Sophie Lambin, and I'm the editorial partner for the Women's Forum for the Economy and Society. At the Women's Forum, we believe that women's voices and vision are crucial to building a more inclusive economy and society. In collaboration with the New York Times, we are delighted to be hosting a series of conversations with women leaders. Today, it's our eighth one since the beginning of the lockdown. These conversations also reflect our desire to play a part in driving equity and justice, and for women to lead the rebuilding of a more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable world. Our speakers are women from around the world, women on the front, line, front lines, and women leading us through the crisis and through the recovery. Today, I'm very excited for, we're going to have a very dynamic conversation with a speaker who will talk to us about women's leadership to build the global economy back better. You can follow our conversation on social media with the hashtag Woman for Inclusion and in her words. And now I'm very pleased to welcome Francesca Donner, Gender Director for the New York Times, who will lead today's conversation. Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sophie. Here we are in the midst of a pandemic. We have the sheer awfulness of the health disaster on one hand, and on the other, an economic fallout that has sent shockwaves into every country on earth. The world is on track for negative growth, Jobs have been shed, especially in sectors dominated by women. Countless family incomes have been pinched beyond words. It seems almost ironic to discuss rebuilding when there remain so many unknowns, and a vaccine, while offering glimmers of hope, remains agonizingly far off. But we humans are resilient, and some of us like to plan, and plan we must. Joining us today is someone who I believe is an optimist, Kristalina Georgieva. She is Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, a role she stepped into last October. Prior to that, she was CEO of the World Bank. She has also served Europe as European Commission Vice President for Budget and Human Resources, and she was a co-chair of the UN Secretary General's High-Level Panel on Humanitarian Financing. Obviously, she has a PhD in economics. So what we were talking about was basically the IMF's role, and what I was curious to understand what I think our audience would like to understand is, is to help us understand how the IMF works. Can you explain how the yep. critical financial packages get meted out and what factors yep. take into account? I'm sorry to, to have you do that again. No problem. I, I would start uh, again from a very, very critical point. Crisis like no other, response like no other. And for the IMF, what it meant was to lean forward to provide emergency financing, especially to countries that are faced with the toughest circumstances, highly dependent on uh, exports of commodities or tourism, mm -hmm. high levels of debt, or very fragile economies. So we went out and said, this is an exogenous shock. It is not because you're managing your economies badly. So we are not going to ask for the traditional IMF conditionalities. We would ask you for only two things. Please pay your doctors, your nurses, improve your health system, and help the most vulnerable people, help the most vulnerable parts of the economy. And then we said, as you do so, please keep the receipts. In other words, be accountable to your citizens for the money the IMF is extending for you. So we made this call. We asked our membership to boost our concessional financing capacity. They did it. They, they uh, first lifted uh, our um, emergency financing two times what it was before the crisis. Then they gave us more resources to provide poor, poor countries with lifelines. Up to this moment, in just four months, we have extended 75 of these financial lifelines. And I can tell you, I had calls in the middle of the night of leaders that were saying this really made it possible to face this crisis with some financial uh, resources in hand. You're asking me how we make these decisions? 
of course we have to meet what we what we call at the front our safeguards in other words we cannot lend to countries if their debt level is so 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 high that by putting more debt we are just making it uh, harder with these countries we are helping them to restructure their debt to bring the debt level uh, down so we can help and we also need to have assurances that we know we have the data in place that gives us a full picture of the uh, financial conditions in countries uh, we are also doing people heard a lot about the financial lifelines but we are doing other things for countries with strong fundamentals like chile peru we have extended uh, credit lines so their buffers their ability to face the crisis are improved and for countries that are in in uh, normal programs we have looked into ways to reinforce these programs uh, to sum it up the fund has a capacity to lend one trillion dollars i want to thank the wisdom of our shareholders uh, prior to the global financial crisis the fund only had 250 billion dollars today we have already extended 250 billion dollars of yeah. which about one third in this last short four months and we are prepared to do more right i'm i'm really glad actually that you brought up uh this phrase strong fundamentals I'd, I'd heard you in a recent ted interview speaking about the importance of a country's strong fundamentals when it comes to weathering a crisis of this magnitude and i'm wondering if you could explain for our audience what you mean by that and then this is the fun part of my question if you were building a country from the ground up what would be your critical strong fundamentals ah so when we talk about strong fundamentals we mean countries putting in place policies that are uh, conducive for growth and employment they are transparent the government is accountable to the citizens uh, and uh, the uh, fiscal uh, balance is what a responsible family would do with its own finances you only spend as much as you can afford to uh, to spend countries that borrow but then invest the money they borrow into productive assets they invest in education in human capital they invest in health they invest in infrastructure and they invest in conditions for the private sector to flourish these are countries with strong fundamentals and what happened in this crisis is so so impressive in march the uh, markets closed down there was such a panic that nobody would lend money to anyone good fundamentals bad fundamentals everybody's cut off in april the markets opened up once advanced economies put in big financial packages they, they their central banks flooded markets with liquidity then for countries with strong fundamentals borrowing at low cost has become again possible and we have seen uh, some 80 billion dollars of new issuance from these uh, countries the moral of the story in good times make your economy resilient put in place responsible policies they will help you in bad times so let's let's talk a little bit about the policies um you wrote recently about the importance of gender responsive fiscal policies and i'm just going to mention some of them you already mentioned some of them um in your answer just now but i'd like to get into a bit more detail so some of the things you've written about were investing in education and in infrastructure subsidizing child care offering parental leave but at least from my perspective these seem to be issues that are overlooked and undermined and underestimated over and over and over and over again and i i want to ask you if you agree with me, or maybe you don't, you certainly don't have to agree with me, but why do you think things like this haven't been prioritized by so many countries? And how do we get straggler countries to prioritize them now? And as a follow-up, I ask a lot of questions. Is there a role that IMF can specifically play here? So the answer to your uh, 
key question why we should do that is crystal clear because it makes sense for everybody it the economics of gender equality is a book already written uh, my former institution the world bank bank calculated that if we were to wake up tomorrow with men and women equal then the world's wealth would be 172 trillion dollars bigger and we know women in on the boards of companies means the companies are stronger their performance is better but above all in this crisis we need to remember something that eleanor roosevelt said that women are like tea bags they get stronger in hot water and it is so very true. I, I see it in my daily decision making that women actually are very resilient to these kinds of shocks. And they also have more empathy for the most vulnerable, for the uh, elderly, for the children, for the handicapped. And that leads to more um, crisis prone policies in, in place but we are risking to walk back on what we have actually moved forward on on gender equality i am very worried hard earned gains we can easily let go of if we don't pay attention to the fact that gender equality doesn't fall from the sky it has to be written into policies and it it has to be uh, fought for. I see four risks uh, for gender equality for losing uh, momentum. The first one is women more than men are in the uh, contact intensive parts of the economy, in hospitality. They are actually a lot in, in healthcare where we need them so badly. But that means that they're losing jobs, they are impacted by unemployment more than men, and the data shows it. Secondly, women are more part of the informal economy, and the informal economy is, is, is hard to support at any point, and therefore they risk to be uh, carrying more the brunt of this crisis through that channel. Three, I don't know whether you live through it, I can, I can tell you my, my, uh, uh, my team's live through it. Women always do more unpaid work at home. Care for kids, for elderly, doing chores. Uh, on average, 4.4 hours a day from a woman. On average, 1.7 hours a day by a man. Big difference. And with this lockdown, women do more. And that is also sometimes, unfortunately, combined with violence against uh, women, a very, very troubling uh, trend. Last but not least, our future. We see boys and girls out of school in countries where there is no digital. And by the way, on digital, women again are behind in access. When they go back to school, more likely it would be more of the boys less of the girls. And this is such a tremendous loss of productive capacity for our future. I, I also saw data recently that really, I mean, breaks my heart. More girls getting forcefully married to ease the burden of families in this crisis. So all of this is happening. And if we don't zero on it, for the benefit of everyone, not just for the benefit of women, we risk to reinforce a huge negative that may come up out of this crisis, and it is higher inequality, higher poverty. So I am grateful to you, uh, Francesca, for zeroing on this topic. Amplify it as much as, as you, as you uh, can, and uh, you can count on me and the fund. Well, you want okay. to what we do at the front? Let's let's talk about unpaid labor, which was just one of the many things you mentioned. It's something I'm very interested in. 
it's a huge economic blocker for women and it was an, a huge economic blocker for women before COVID hit the scene. Yes. It's kind of that COVID made it more obvious. I'd like you to talk, if you don't mind, how about how we might use this pandemic as a turning point for rethinking how we account for mm -hmm. unpaid labor, how we put a dollar amount on it. And you are an economist, and I would love to ask you this question because I've been seeking an answer. Can you imagine a time when unpaid labor might be factored into GDP? Well, that, that is a uh, long standing uh, uh, question. And I want to go back to my, uh, my uh, point in the beginning that the crisis is an opportunity and we do need to rethink uh, our economies for the future. We need to also rethink the data uh, uh, basis that informs our decisions. Uh, so why not now? Uh, we actually are talking uh, with my colleagues at, uh, at the IMF that are dealing with data. There will be a chance to think about GDP also from the perspective of greening the economy, can we think more uh, profoundly about a change in GDP so it is a more accurate indicator of what fits in our prosperity? Uh, today, as you know, we count pollution. So you produce, you pollute, GDP goes up. Hmm. Why are we still there? Uh, so there is work to be done. Um, I and I, 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 I don't know whether we would succeed to uh, cut through it. There will be a number of issues to be worked through. This is certainly on the list, and I can I can uh, pledge to you that we would uh, take a, a, a chance, a shot at that uh, question. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, actually, we have a question from someone in our audience. Um, Abir Chibado from Beirut, Lebanon, is curious. Mm -hmm. How can the IMF ensure financial packages and support meet the needs of 50 or slightly over 50 percent of the population, women, um, if women are neither in decision making roles nor in negotiations, how can IMF specifically um, support their participation? Yeah. So I want to recognize my predecessor, Christine Lagarde, a great champion for gender equality. It started during her time and I, it, I'm taking uh, uh, the uh, uh, baton and I'm running with it. Uh, the, the IMF has already provided to 105 countries support to integrate gender into economic analysis and policy making. Uh, in some countries, we actually went that far to make a uh, gender equality strategy a condition for IMF financial support. Not right now in the crisis that was done just before the crisis. Uh, Niger is one of these countries. And now in the crisis, we are very strongly advocating that uh, as money is being directed, it has to go effectively in the hands of men and women. And we are particularly stressing women because they tend to be better stewards, if you wish, of that kind of... Uh, um, uh, support uh, provided at the time of, of, of crisis. We also want to make sure that as we are going to inject either countries themselves or through uh, IMF and others assistance, money for stimulus for the recovery, that there are clear requirements of how the money should be used. We have introduced gender-based budgeting. We are working, we're expanding this in our interactions with countries because when we do it, we get bigger bang for the buck. Uh, and I want to repeat myself, it is not just about women. It is about their families, their communities, their countries. Women do well, countries do well. Right. Let's talk a minute about resilience. Um, it's a word I've heard you say quite a lot. Um, I've uh, heard you say in a prior conversation that with regards to resilience, the more we are together, the more resilience is amplified. 
from my perspective, I feel like we're living in a world which is splintering into isolationist nations, not relying on one another, not learning from each other, and certainly not sharing ideas. I love the idea of re resilience and collaboration in theory, but I'd love to hear from you how we get there in practice. And as a part two, um, who do you think is doing it well? Uh, it could be countries, it could be groups. So let me, let me start first by saying that uh, there are actually good examples of countries coming together. And I'm very proud of the IMF because at the IMF, our membership did come uh, together. Our advanced economies have extended more financial capacity for us. They gave us money for grants. 29 poorest members of the IMF now do not have to pay us back to serve their loans because of these grants. And we, when we asked uh, our membership uh, triple our concessional financing capacity, they did it in, in record time, in two months, and they actually gave us even more. Thank God, because we do need more. In our decision-making, uh, I have seen time and again that if we work hard, if we zero on where we can bring people together, on the issues that unite us rather than on what divides us, we can come to a uh, collective answer. Now, uh, you ask me, is this always? Well, there are issues on which it is much more difficult to reach consensus, but then we can prioritize in a way that builds that confidence of the uh, collective. When I look around the world, uh, just uh, days ago, the European Union adopted uh, $750 billion uh, uh, recovery fund. It was extremely difficult. I, you mentioned I was in charge of your budget. I have gone through sleepless nights of budget negotiations. But the countries came together and the EU also has been leading in bringing the world around um, access to vaccines, uh, funding uh, in a way so poor countries can also get access to vaccine. We have to persevere. When I look around the world, I see countries that have uh, done really well in the pandemic. We need to run, uh, learn from them. Not always rich countries, Vietnam, great example. They, they have been amazingly effective acting early and, and actually protecting their most vulnerable uh, people. Uh, we know the example of uh, New Zealand, fantastic, um, being able to now watch cricket. I'm not a cricket fan, don't know what cricket exactly is, but I, I was so happy to see New Zealanders watching cricket. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I think of, the, uh, of this, uh, the power of the collective, uh, 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 Francesca, Look, the crisis is telling us something very simple. We are as strong as our weakest link. And it is so obvious we are in this together. So we will work very hard from the IMF to make the case for universal access to vaccine and treatment, to help countries have the fiscal capacity to participate in getting access uh, to vaccine and treatment. And more importantly, to, to, to seek these areas of convergence, uh, amplify the voices of those that are for cooperation, that are for trade. So we get uh, that voices to be uh, more uh, actively heard. One of our problems is that, uh, unfortunately, bad news has a big mouth and good news is quiet. Uh, so part of my job as an optimist, as a believer in the goodness of people, is to strive to amplify these voices of goodness. Great. I, I'm, I'm glad you said you were an optimist because I made that outrageous claim at the start of our conversation where I declared I thought you were an optimist. And as you answered the question, apparently no one in the audience could hear you. So now they know out of your mouth that you are a self-proclaimed optimist. So I've, I've now- I'm a, I'm a pragmatic optimist. I believe that optimism has to be fed 
with success. And that success happens when actions are calibrated properly to expectations. <laughs> so, uh, but I do believe that we have good stories to tell and we need to tell the stories more often. That relief, the fact that we got G20 on the call from the IMF and the World Bank to agree on moratorium of that service with the Paris Club and China and the Gulf coming together is a great success story. So let's celebrate it. Absolutely. I've, I'm getting one or two um, questions uh, from the audience and, and they seem to kind of be following a similar vein. And I, I think the, the, the idea here is kind of really thinking about how IMF is ensuring that packages are targeted towards women, that women are served, that women's needs are met, that um, sort of economic stimulus is distributed fairly. There's a lot of concern, as I'm sure you probably have yourself, that women are kind of cut out of the picture. Um, and I know we talked about it a little bit before, but it keeps coming around. So <laughs> I'm gonna hand it back to you again. And it is a very fair question because uh, we do need to build not only good policy advice and good recommendations, but to do two more things. One, to relentlessly train policymakers to be able to apply these policies in practice. And then to insist on accountability for their application. Uh, and there, I personally believe in transparency being the citizens, in this case, the women's best friend. Mm. Put out what you do for everybody to see. And two, walk our own talk. Let's face it, the IMF still has some way to go. We have done a lot. Uh, Christine Lagarde broke the uh, glass ceiling. I came through, no cuts. For <laughs> me, for the second woman, it was easier. And what I take now in my hands is to relentlessly pursue gender equality in our ranks. So we, we demonstrate the values we preach. Uh, and, I, and I can tell you a piece of very good news. Uh, uh, we start, when I came, we had 25% uh, uh, of the senior management being women. So we are 10 months later, we have 10% more. We now are 35% senior women. And uh, obviously we would get to uh, equality. Uh, and I believe as much as I believe in working with countries, putting the accountability uh, mechanisms in, in place, I believe in um, walking, walking our own uh, uh, talk. And I actually think that uh, uh, you having this uh, senior women coming during this incredible crisis, that is a confidence building for other women to step up. I just, I want to just ask you one thing about what you said. So you, you're now at, it sounds like 35% of women in the, in the top yeah. leadership. Is the goal to get to 50-50? 50-50. Uh, we are, we have over 40%, 42% nearly women at mm -hmm. different levels. But what matters always, as you know, in an organization is the top. So we have about 20 people right there at the top. And uh, we have moved up and we will move up and we will have uh, equality. And uh, uh, those who know my history, when I was in the European Commission, we set the target, we met the target. At the bank, we set the target, we met the target. Uh, and it is, again, it's not because of uh, numbers. It is because of the meaning of equality. We make better decisions when we have diverse perspectives. And especially for an organization like the IMF, having that empathy that women bring, uh, having the experience of women sorting out 
all kinds of disputes, um, keeping the peace at home, all of that matters, but also the professional, the analytical uh, contribution of women and the analytical contribution of men. When they come together, we are so much better off. Well, I think that's a pretty extraordinary note to end on. I want to thank you so much for your time. This was fabulous. I'm going to hand it back to Sophie, who I believe will conclude our session. And really very interesting, very exciting. I know I'll be watching the IMF and what happens in the months ahead as we solve this together. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Christianina and um, Francesca for this fascinating conversation. I will recall a few things for what you've just said. Um, in particular, women are like tea bags. I like that one. They get stronger in hot water and that's why they are so key in driving an inclusive recovery. You also give us a message of optimism about our goodness and our resilience and it's good to be reminded of that tempered by a warning. However, gender equality does not fall from the skies. It needs to be written in policy and in action. And this is something the Women's Forum is very com committed to enable. And therefore, uh, very much as Kara Karaza said it at the beginning of this conversation, this is a conversation to be continued. So I want to finish by thanking everyone, our engaged audience that gave us plenty of questions. We could only take a few and ask you all to share this important conversation on social media and watch the space because in September, we very much hope to continue this conversation with our uh, partner, The New York Times. So, Goodbye and thank you very much everyone.